in the Porsche. Yeah, so picture me rolling. Fresh car smell, scab pack with the rolly. Laces off the tug, get attached to a bulky. Strip club bouncer, got them circuits, it's a folly. Hydraulic switches, big body bandits, slap in the trunk. Hey, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed. And like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Appreciate all the comments and the supports when it came to my prison spread challenge. I know how to do a few of them, but I just thought that was one to be clever because, you know, the homie Doves did the rice bowl, the gunner did the spread. I felt like doing a wet burrito. There's, there's a lot of crafty and creative ways that people get down when it comes to chefing it up and cooking it up in prison, man. There's a lot of ideas, man. I hope a lot more people come out mentioning some videos maybe me gunner can go back to back like hey challenge you know a couple more prison spreads man they're they're unique they're different yes they kind of hurt your stomach yes they're very unhealthy but in jail when you're working out the way we do and all those burpees and buzz down routines you're gonna be hungry a lot and, and trust me that food is easy to take down when you're hungry and you're starving in jail with the way they feed us in jail i want to get into two topics today two topics that came from my subscribers one of them is going to be about, you know, he does, he did recognize that a lot of people, in accordance to my movement, went against Snoop. He's heard about the previous videos that I did prior to this channel and the uh, the beginning videos of me talking down on Snoop. And he asked me, he actually asked me a legitimate question, you know, is he asked me if there's anything good I can say about Snoop. So I said, you know what? I will. And on another note, another subscriber also asked me about, have I ever ran into an individual that I removed from the main line? If so, how is it? So I'll get into these two topics to answer my subscriber questions. With that being said, man, hit the subscription button, hit the like, always leave a comment because I'm always interested in what you guys got to say as well. Let's get into it. First, let me tell you, uh, let me give you a backstory on how I met Snoop. It's real easy. I was on Sat F. Uh, e yard the level three pending transfer to Kern Valley, the level four, 180, where he he was at in the hole, and I'd say his celly was a mo from Madera. Uh, me and the compas on that yard, we were like maybe seven eight deep, seven eight deep. But I was messing, like I said, I was messing with the homie David Martinez from Westside to Larry. He was hidden. Worm had the plugs to everybody. He knew everybody on the yard. Big Worm. And myself, you know, we did a little Tulare thing, man. We had a, the homie Tino from San Jose. We had the homie Chino. He was from Fresno Bulldogs. He was an ex-homie. He was an ex-Bulldog as well. You know, there was quite a few of us, but we were spread out in different buildings. So we kind of looked at it like, you know, each comp on his own building, you know, he can, he can turn that into a Playboy compound, make money, generate. That's pretty much was, that was pretty much his area, getting all the money. So now we're not crossing, you know, we're not crossing business lines, you know, infringing on one another's business. So, you know, being spread out like that. You know, we weren't together nitpicking on each other. We go to yard together, do our committees, so on and so forth. Worm already had known Snoop for a while. Worm got in contact with Snoop because an individual landed from Sad F D yard onto E yard, and the homies from D yard got at Worm and pretty much told him, "Hey, you got to take care of this individual." So it was him, the homie Negro from Salinas, and the homie Chevy, which was a selling. Remember. Snoop started off on Sad F D R. That was one of his first S and Ys, and he's he structured it up and he laced it up as best as he could before he got kicked out of there. So I remember being on E Yard. We wound up getting the cell phones. We were me, Worm, David, a lot of us. There was a there was an ex Bulldog from East Side Fresno named Drifter, who later found out came up with some weird charges, but he was there. He was one of the ones that was helping us hit. And, um, you know, we were all winning. We were all in the cell tycoon and just, just having fun on the phone. And Snoop gets a letter. How he managed to let Snoop know that we had clappers, he just comes up to me and goes, hey, bro, this is a Snoop cell phone. Snoop was in uh, Kern Valley in the triple CMS program, and he wound up knocking some old dude, his, his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his tech clinician. And they bought him a little, a little, just a little, little smartphone, a little small one. It was tiny, no camera, no nothing. You know, I give him a call, introduce myself over the phone. He winds up giving it to Mo. Me and Mo start chopping it up. Mo, they're, they're, they're bringing in dope in Kern Valley. I asked Mo, hey, bro, if you guys ever need dope, man, I got a homegirl that's from Visa that could drop it off, run it in for you guys. If you guys ever need that connect, I got access to, we got access to a lot of out here. You know, I was just extending my hand to show them that, you know, we was out here hitting, we was out here winning on some Playboy stuff. They were actually, nah, nah, we're good, bro. What Snoop just wanted me to get in touch with you. He wanted to introduce himself. Says, keep doing your thing. And he shot me the CCOs. 
I'm talking about like for seven or nine days straight, they were just in the cell texting me the CCOs and I would have to sit there and write them down, read the texts and write them down. Once I got them all on a full piece of paper, set, circulated it to the homies, circulated it to Worm, everybody made their copies, everybody had the copy for the cell when the CCOs were coming out. He done them in 2010, but they hadn't hit all facilities yet. And they weren't at this facility at the time. This was around 2000, maybe 13. So, you know, I, I, I helped that yard get established in accordance to what he wanted to be done. That was the first time I met him. We only had one conversation. I go to Kern Valley. I get a request to take care of two individuals. About seven of us jumped two individuals. I got the pictures. Maybe next video, I'm going to showcase the pictures. I'm already getting ad suitability anyways on a lot of my videos, so I'm not going to get paid like that much. But I'll show you guys some of the pictures. But I'm only going to be able to detail the removal just enough so that way it doesn't incriminate nobody. So I take care of this, this removal per Snoop. Snoop shot the word to foe. Foe shot the word to Crow. Crow let us know. Plus, there's a backstory to that removal that's going to trip you guys out. The, the, once I break the video down, it's, it's vicious. I take care of the removal. I come back to the yard, do like two more batteries. I wind up getting transferred to Tehachapi. I knocked out this dude named Danger from 18th Street. His name was his last name was McCollin. I finally got my first class ticket to Tehachapi. Now I'm like, damn, I get to go where Snoop said. You know, I heard Snoop had sewed it up, had it structured up. The homies were good there. I get there. I'm on orientation with the homie uh, Chico or Chito or Chico from uh, Colonia Chiques from Highland. And uh, we're chopping it up and then I know the Mac reps were coming. The homies already wrote me a card, got my information. I sent my copy of my 114D lockup order of what I was there for. Shout out to them. They screened it, came back, said, hey, the Snoop's the Mac rep. He's going to come talk to you. I just so happened to walk to the door. Mind you, I only had seen pictures, pictures of Snoop. But I still didn't recognize Snoop who he was. I hadn't seen him in person. So I see this dude walking up to the door and he has these little, his glasses on, these little gold frame glasses. He has his hair spiked up in the front and brushed forward. I'm 5'10", Snoop's like 6'1", so he's not that bigger than me, but he's perceived to be a big individual when it comes to other people. So he walks up to the door and he's like, hey, what's up, bro? I heard somebody in his cell saying they were Northern Rider. And I looked at him and I was like, why, well, what's up, man? Who are you? He goes, yeah, what they call you? I was like, man, they call me Manitas, man. Who are you? Didn't recognize the guy. And out of nowhere, here it comes. Motherfucker, this is motherfucking badass Snoop, a Playboy president, Playboy. And I looked at him and I said, oh, damn, bro. I had to do that right now with this individual. Because like I said, I heard, dude, there, there's been notorious reputations of this guy. You know, his arrogance, his attitude, his being a belligerent drunk, his aggressiveness, the way he yells at people when he's just trying to talk to people. Dude, I used to hear that. Every, the combo used to tell me he was in Don Diva magazine. He was, they had an article on him in the Feds magazine, which all came out to be false. But, you know, a lot of people put a lot of extras on this guy. I don't know why they put so much extras on this dude's reputation. Who knows, man? People in jail just have great imaginations. You know, the imagination runs wild. So I look at him. I was like, oh, that's what's up, homie. Nice to meet you. And I'm just being humble because I can really care less, bro. I, don't, I didn't roll the carpet off of this individual. We were just... You know, we were from the same faction, the same movement. He was identifying himself as the president. Didn't really care to that because I was my own man. I just pretty much just followed suit and did what I did. So after he does his long ass two and a half minute introduction, he was under the assumption that I was saying Northern Riders because the All Star said I was a Northern Rider. And he goes, hey, anybody from High Desert coming down here saying that they're Northern Riders or ain't with the business will be reprimanded with serious repercussions. And you know, he goes on like that. That's how he talks. That's how he really talks. and But he does it with aggressiveness. Like, he stares at you in your eyes. And I'm just looking at him like, bro, what the hell? You got a high desert got to do it. I didn't know nothing about high desert. So he went on this two and a half minute spill. And I'm just staring at him. But I noticed, like, man, dude, this fool. The more he talks, because I know he's drunk off light lane, white lightning. He's spitting on my window. And that shit frustrates me. I hate having spit on my window. You know, I look out my window all day. So I'm looking at him like, as soon as he gets done, I was like, I grabbed the toilet paper and I wrote the toilet paper on my hand. I cut his feet and I was like, all right, bro, nice to meet you. Uh, hey, can you do me a favor? He's like, what's that, playboy? And I, I slid the toilet paper under the door and I was like, hey, can you wipe my window, bro? It's, it's kind of dirty. 
And he, and he literally grabbed my toilet paper with his shoe and he kicked it. And he goes, man, I ain't going to do that shit right now, Playboy. I got shit to tell you. So I looked at him and I'm like, whatever, bro. You spit all over my damn window, bro. So now I'm frustrated in my head because I was like, bro, wipe my fucking window down. But he didn't want to wipe my window because he's so drunk and wants to tell me what he needs to tell me. And he leans back on the rails and he puts his arm and he goes, hey, hey, Playboy, I heard what you did with Choco on Poison, Playboy. That's what's up, man. That's raw right there. I respect that. I already told the homies about the story, what's going on, man. I can't wait to meet you. In my head, I was like, bro, this is a removal. But the way they tell it on the, the way they tell it on the yard is that the individual that, that we removed, that, you know, we did use razor blades, we did use bangers, and we kind of, uh, he had a Playboy bunny on his, on his, on his eyebrow, like right here, and we ripped it off during the removal. So that sent a shockwave towards everybody in the facilities, everybody that was there with choke on poison that knew who their reputation is, that weren't even affiliated, heard about that, and they were like, man, them, them fools did that food dangerous. But it's nothing to brag about. It's just we took care of business. We felt like we were doing something right. We were doing something that the Playboy asked, so on and so forth. Whatever the case may be, I didn't need no glorification, and I didn't really care less. I was just there just to program. I was coming home. I was looking at the DA referral, so it didn't even matter to me. I just wanted a program. And I was like, that's what's up. He goes, hey, man, the Playboy's gathered a bunch of a bunch of cosmetics, a bunch of food. Man, you got a bag coming, Playboy. Don't even trip. It's on its way. That's how he talks. After getting to know the dude for a couple of months before he got transferred out for uh, disturbing the program and almost inciting a riot with the cops, you know, he was talking, it was a riot that kicked off and he was talking shit to the cops. Why, during the riot, for no reason, I don't know why he did. And he pretty much, him and Blanco were right there, laying next to each other. And the cops were going up to Snoop and they were like, hey, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up. And they stood over Snoop and they had the uh, the, the 40, 40 millimeter, that, that gun they shoot, the little rubber balls. They had it pointed towards his back, but weren't touching his back. And he was laying on the ground and we were all laying on the ground. And he was like, playboys, you already know, playboys, if he touches me, playboy, get off. So next thing you know, I seen everybody just get up in a pussy position, like ready. Like, do you know how that feels, bro? Like, this one thing going at it with another group segment, another bunch of inmates. I'm fine with that. But going at it with cops, bro, we're, we're about to have it for years to come. They don't overlook that. We're going to get our property broken, our property stolen, our property sold. We're going to have nothing in the cell. We ain't going to have toilet paper to wipe our asses. We ain't going to have bars of soap or deodorant. We're going to go through hell for this. But with him, if you don't do what he says, he's the kind of type where, you know, you're probably going to get removed afterwards if you're not acknowledging him. So around that time, like, he had this crazy ass following that and if he snapped his fingers, they jumped. And I seen all the homies get up and I'm like, oh, shit, what are we doing? And I see the cops get ready and the cop sees that we're getting ready and he backs up and he calls for backup and all the cops surround Snoop, cuff him up, escort him out. That kind of thing. You know, that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of person he was. And that's not really a bad thing. Because when you got that kind of level of respect in which he had, either from even from other group segments, I understand a lot of people on YouTube perceive him as, you know, a narcissistic person. I've mentioned that myself. But when you look at a, at a different, look at it from a different angle, the pros and the cons, I can speak about a lot of the cons, but the pros is like, you know, his presence demanded respect. And the thing about jail is, Respect is everything. Respe People would do a lot and go to extreme measures for that level of respect. I myself used to do that. Once he was gone and a lot of us actually had a, began to develop heavy voices and becoming highly influential members when it comes to Playboy committees, you know, we all became that person. I even said it myself in my last video. I started losing myself here with these kind of politics as opposed to the other committees and the other prison yards I was at because they were different. They all, everybody wanted to be like him, so I, st I, I felt... Like I had to play with, I had to play fire with fire. So I had to develop that personality and develop those aggressive traits in order to be noticed and recognized because that's what people at this facility recognize the most. Aggressiveness, passion, ambition. You know, that the demand for respect. It wasn't about gaining respect no more. To actually be a facility where you're gonna demand it, you're gonna give it to somebody like they ask, like they feel like they deserve, not earned. Or you're going to get knocked down. That's why there were so many fights and so much level of violence that partakes in to actually be that a lot of people don't know about. People were getting hurt and killed at that facility. But that's the kind of person he was. One thing I can say about this individual is if he was going to put you down and criticize you about something, say if you made a, say if you did something that he didn't like, 
or that was against, you know, our idealisms of, you know, playboy standards. He'd put you, he'd wait for you to come to the yard and, if, and wait for all the guampas to come around the table, introduce themselves or say what's up, you know, get their greetings out the way before they start programming on the yard to go work out. The first 10, 20 minutes of yard, everybody surrounds the, the, the playboy table. We talk about business, who owes money, who we're going to have to look out for, who's on their way, anything from any, any letters from any facilities, what's on the agenda. Then we can go about our separate ways and go program and go mingle with everybody else. He would sit you right there in front of everybody and air out your laundry. And he will belittle you. He will talk down on you. He will be so far as to be condescending to you and question you. And I mean like aggressively question, like, but what's going through your mind, playboy? You know, what the fuck are you thinking, playboy? Why, what, what makes you think this is right? He would go on and on and on and question you to the point you're kind of like quiet. And I would just sit there and just look at individuals like, damn, I couldn't. I'm a, if you don't let me answer, bro, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a fit. But I'd watch people just take it in stride. And then afterwards, as soon as he was done and you gave your answer, you, you, can, you pretty much confess to your sins or, you know, regret your mistakes or realize the errors in your ways. Then he would like, play, well, you should be doing it like this. You should be doing this because of this. You know, you make, you, you make us look bad. You don't make just yourself look bad. You make us all look bad. We're supposed to level our higher standards. You know, we're supposed to be promoting ourselves in a different fashion. We're not like the rest of these individuals. We're our own entity. You know, he would get into the spill to pick you back up. So the whole purpose is, is to put you down, break you down, but lift you back up. So he would do that in the same argument, which I thought was creative and unique. To be able to put somebody down and lift you up at the same time to build you. He was good at that. And a lot of us develop that. That same trait. Because sometimes, you know, when you want... Sometimes when you're, when you're cool with somebody and it's your brother. Sometimes it makes it hard to address these matters. Even on the main line. When you're cool with somebody, you know if you address them and you try to correct them. And you try to confront them about certain situations. And they feel some type of way. It kind of ruins friendships sometimes. Some people don't like to take constructive criticism. Then people start developing negative stances, and next thing you know, he goes around the yard not liking you no more. He ain't showing you no love no more. You don't get no soups, no dub, no nothing. He just distances himself. He feels like you betrayed him. And these kind of practices and situations, Snoop did incorporate that to be addressed as everybody, in front of everybody. That way everybody can share their point of view with you, so everybody can show their, their, their insight, their viewpoints, their constructive criticism, build you back up. And then everybody shows you love and acts normal like nothing happened, including the individual who's being corrected. That was one thing I like, man, because it, it gave it let everybody become submissive, but yet receptive to the constructive criticism that needed to be done in order to uplift us as a whole, as a people, as a person, as an individual. Now, that was one thing, that's one thing I could talk about Snoop that I liked most. I really did. And I thought that was clever. And to this day... That's why I kind of love constructive criticism myself. Like, I be at work sometimes, and if I'm doing something wrong and my leads clean it and, and just overlook it, I kind of get flustered. I always try to go to my leads and my, my supervisors and my, my coordinators and be like, hey, bro, where did I mess up at? What did I do wrong? Hey, show me how I could do it different. Or every time I get in trouble for leaving my machines dirty, I tell them, hey, well, what can I do different? What do you do? You know, I always develop the sense of that I need feedback so I can grow as a person. That's what I learned from Jen. That's actually what I learned from the S and Y. Is that people are going to tell you their ways of doing it, show you their ways of doing it. It's all a matter of you can be receptive towards growing as a person. And I think that's the hardest part people have today, nowadays, is they can't take it. They can't take that constructive criticism. It's called growth. I'm all about growth. This YouTube, everybody, I, even though these are my stories, do you guys realize that I talk to a lot of these other YouTubes that do prison genres asking for advice, asking for their opinions, gaining their feedback? So I can grow. I don't want to. I don't want to be on this YouTube channel portraying myself to be better than anybody else, or just because I reached ten thousand subscribers in four months now I'm better than them. My content's better than them. No, I still got room to grow. I still got room to learn, and I want to learn. Another thing that um I liked about Snoop, I thought was funny. It's gonna make them look bad, but to us in jail and in the prison society. It makes you look good. So you tell me what you guys think about this. He comes back about a week later after spitting all over my window. He brings me my bag of canteen. I'm talking about $100 worth of canteen. Soups, beans, rice, hygiene, uh, some dope, cosmetics, everything. Books to read, magazines to read, letters, stamps. They bless you. Any, 
any company that comes in that facility gets a bag dropped off to him. If they're certified, they get a bag dropped off to him. That's what I like. That's what he incorporated. He says, any company that comes out the hole or arrives to the facility that's certified and is known, everybody in the yard has to come out to the yard and put a bag together for him that no homeboy should be deprived. That should, we should be out here on these yards gaining the luxuries and riches, making money. He was the kind of type of, he, he was a Mac rep for like a, almost a year, so he'd go to your cell. And if he's seen that you didn't have no canteen, he was getting, it's not about whether or not you have family that's taking care of you or not. You can create a hustle in jail. There's people and there's opportunity that you can gain from. Individuals that you can benefit from and add to you, to add to your situation, to elevate your situation. That's what he promoted. If your locker was empty, it was inexcusable. And he'd be at your door like, what's up, Playboy? What's up with that locker? Like he would go purposely go up to your cell and ask like, hey, bro, hey, Playboy, I need some, I need some pork rinds, a meat log, some dill pickles, and a bag of beans, bro. We're going to do a spread on the yard. Just to test you. If he couldn't pull those items out, he's going to want to see your locker. He's going to want to see that bag of canteen under your bed. If it's small, he's going to be on your ass. What are you doing to, uh, to benefit yourself, bro? What kind of, what kind of revenue is this? Because in the acronym R-I-D-E-R, Riders, the E is, stands for economy. So we're supposed to be utilizing the yards to take care of ourselves, to be self-sufficient. So if you didn't have more than $50 of canteen of just strictly food, not hygiene, food in your cell, you were getting lectured. And then when you go to yard, you're going to get lectured again. And then you're going to get lectured by everybody else because how are you... How are you able to be a playboy, call yourself a playboy, but you can't take care of yourself and you can't take care of the next brother? I mean, that's what a brotherhood consists of. We're taking care of one another. We should be there for one another. Provide for one another in the event that our, we don't need our families. Our, we, didn't, we, we shouldn't be dragging our families through this. You don't know how many homies come to prison five or six times on repeated offenses and new charges and the first people they turn to is the same people they, that were there for them, these last prior offenses, just dragging them through the mud with them? Placing that financial burden on them. You know, it's very unfortunate. So us, we were teaching ourselves, make a hustle. Make brownies. Make pruno. Make white lightning. Here's some dope. Get it, flip it, bring the money back, buy more dope, so on and so forth. Me, I did banos. I did drawings. I did cars. I tattooed on all my cellies. That was another good quality I liked about the individual. And I end it, I'll end it right now because I'll probably do a part two since the video is long already as it is. So I'll do a part two to this to answer the other question for my subscriber. But I remember there was an individual. His name was Weddle from Merced. I just know he had an RDR in the back of his head. He was light-skinned. He, he was on orientation with me. He was downstairs. He comes about a week later after spitting on my door, drops off the bag of food, and he goes, hold on, playboy. I got to go talk to this dude down here real quick. Weddle had got his property... Was talking to a porter, uh, and he bought a, I think a, a, a hundred paper of dope. It wasn't a quarter; it was just a hundred paper. But he couldn't pay it with the JPay or um, a green dot or a PayPal. So what he did is he clucked his brand new shoes. I think he had uh, some some bad Nikes. He had some bad. He had some good Nikes. Snoop hates when you cluck your stuff. Snoop doesn't want you out there. With dirty shoes or worn out clothes. If you got money to buy dope, you got money to buy clothes. What's your first priority? If you prioritize dope over your over, over your self well being, your own welfare, you're more likely gonna leave the movement. You're actually gonna get pushed back for that. And I remember hearing him come up to the cell, he's like, hey Playboy, did you really just cluck your Nikes for some dope? Are you fucking serious? Whoa, 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 he he got on him bad. And he's pretty, he was pretty much telling this individual, like, like he ain't shit, he's worthless, he's a dope fiend, how could, he, how could he do that to himself? How could he lower standards for a piece of paper that were better than that? He went on this two, three minute rant just yelling at him in front of the whole pod. The whole pod was quiet listening to him because none of us had our property, so everything echoed. And all I hear is, well, I was like, hey, bro, can you get on the phone and, and ask my girl to send me some money then on my books, bro? I ain't got no money, bro. He's on my, give me the goddamn number, playboy, shoot that shit. He grabs the phone, and the phone's like, I can look down from my cell, and I can see the phone right there. He gets on the phone, she answers the phone, and he asks, is it such and such there? She says, it's her. He, I guess she had asked him who this is. He goes, this is motherfucking badass Snoop, Playboy president, and a published author. 
I don't know why he decided to say I'm a published author. Like that was any relevant information that she wanted to know, that she needed to know. But he said it. And I remember I'm out the door laughing, telling myself, like, no, he did not just say that, bro. And then he just went on this different rant. Like, he didn't even ask. He was like, he pretty much said, from what I remember, this is what he said. He's like, man, you're a dumbass dope fiend of a boyfriend is asking for $100 on his books. Why aren't you sending money on his books? Why does this man have to call you and tell you to put money on his goddamn books? You should be doing that anyways. Straight up. And he starts yelling at her. He goes, a matter of fact, your motherfucking man, you need to talk to him, man. You need to write him a goddamn letter and ask him to tell you why he threw his shoes away and he cut his shoes for some motherfucking dope. He's over here being a goddamn dopey and he needs to raise his motherfucking standards before I get rid of his ass. Throws on this crazy ass spill. And he's just, the whole 15 minutes he's yelling at this girl on the phone. Then hangs up the phone, goes back to the homie cell, slides the number. That fool heard everything that he said to his girl. Came. Told me his goodbyes, went to yard, that individual wound up walking away. So it's a funny story. To me, it was good quality because, you know, he presented, you know, an actual fact. Like, don't be a dopey, don't be getting rid of your stuff. The, the money, the hard-earned money that your family's providing to take care of you to make sure you're okay and you're giving it away for dope. But still, it's a bad look because he yelled at this individual, embarrassed this individual, embarrassed his girl, yelled at his girl over this individual, and the individual got should I say he was discouraged and he walked away from it. So they made him cover the tattoo over the back of his head and they kicked him off the table. So you guys let me know, is that a good quality or bad quality? These are the qualities that I can share with you that I seen personally. Remember, I wasn't on the yard long with that individual. But I got to see just certain things and certain certain ways and certain practices that he was that 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 do represent him well. I know, my, I, know, I know it seems hypocritical because I talk down on them, but I'm always going to point the good and the bad out. A subscriber asked me an honest, genuine question, and I felt like it was only right to answer this subscriber's question as well. There's good qualities. Everybody has good qualities and bad qualities. I got so many bad qualities that I can tell you about that I hate myself for. Maybe I'll do a video on them. As, as, as a man, you, you got to be able to recognize the flaws in your ways where you can grow. Your room for improvement. Because the only way you're ever going to reach the pinnacle of refinement is when you actually do, when you become self-analytical, when you can actually break yourself down and ask yourself what's the good and bad and what you could do better. It's the only way you're going to grow and become a better man in life. Do you guys agree with me on that? So with that being said, man, stay tuned for part two. I'll get into the other part of my subscriber question because this video is already long. With that being said, man, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.